1.337 billion years ago, two titans of the cosmos, each with many times the mass of the sun, engaged in a gravitational ballet. As they drew nearer, the dance quickened. Their immense gravitational forces warped the very fabric of space and time, pulling the black holes inexorably closer and closer. Finally, in a cataclysmic embrace, they became one. While silent, the black hole merger does leave its mark on the universe, not through sound, but through space and time. But what do I mean that it leaves its mark on space and time? In 2015, LIGO made a groundbreaking discovery that won the Nobel Prize two years later, the detection of gravitational waves for the first time, proving yet another of the many fantastical predictions of Einstein's theory of general relativity. The detection of these gravitational waves required two interferometers 3,000 kilometers across the continental United States to measure the same impossibly small signal 10 milliseconds apart. The signal was caused by two black holes merging. Once the signals were recorded, they had to be filtered to find the tiniest ripple in space and time. You see, it turns out that collecting data from a black hole merger that happened billions of years ago, billions of light years away, is actually quite hard. This means that the data that we do get is noisy. In fact, with data this noisy, conventional fitting methods won't work to extract our signal. Okay, so then how do we find our merger? We have the data, so we have to fit it somehow. Well, we use a technique known as matched filtering. Matched filtering uses a theoretically simulated sample batch of data and compares it to a measured signal. During World War II, radar operators used a primitive form of matched filtering to detect enemy aircraft. By comparing received signals with known patterns of enemy planes, they could identify and track them despite the noisy signals. One of the war's most closely guarded secrets, the miracle of radar, is now revealed. Shortwave radio signals sent out and returned as echoes allow the plotting room to spot the target. The cathode tube. Recently, it was shown that this same technique can be implemented on a quantum computer using a classical quantum hybrid algorithm. This algorithm can be, and was, implemented on current noisy quantum computers with similar results to what classical computers can do. I'll leave the paper that describes this in the description for those interested in reading it. Now, for the obligatory disclaimer. This paper does not claim that quantum computers can do matched filtering better than classical computers. The interesting thing here is not that quantum computers are doing the problem faster, but rather that quantum computers approach this problem in a completely different way. This approach, and the thinking that gets us there, is the main takeaway, because it may help us discover new quantum algorithms that do, in fact, have a speedup over classical computers. First, I'm going to talk about the classical algorithm, so we can get a feel for how match filtering works, and then I'll talk about the quantum version after. The classical version of match filtering operates on a simple idea. We use theoretical physics, meaning Einstein's theory of general relativity, to predict what the signal of a black hole merger would look like. When we do this, we can slide the template signal that we generate around on top of the data that is being recorded, and look for where the signal-to-noise ratio is maximized. This is the point where the template and the data have the best match. The signal is usually described as a chirp. As the black holes spiral in towards one another, gravitational waves are produced spiraling outwards from the pair. The frequency of these waves is proportional to the distance between the black holes. When the pair finally merges, a final set of waves is released. The chirp moniker derives from converting the signal into audible frequencies, which gives this sound. Often, for the signal processing part of the match filtering algorithm, the actual data is processed and matched to a template in Fourier space. A Fourier transformation is a complicated math algorithm that deserves its own video, so check out 3Blue1Brown's videos for more detail. But for the purposes of this video, a Fourier transform takes an oscillating signal and pulls out the respective frequencies that are found within the signal. This property makes it great for eliminating noise, because usually noise is random and doesn't occur at specific frequencies. This is not true for all noise sources, but carefully filtering out known noise sources makes this a good method for signal analysis. Additionally, the comparison between the data and theory in Fourier space is more computationally efficient than the traditional method. 
Scientists at the two different LIGO labs, Hanford and Livingston, both independently take data and compare the signal they get at every instance in time to the theoretical predictions using match filtering. Even if the signal shows a match, the moment of truth follows. To be sure that the signal that they measured was real, even if it corresponded to the theoretical predictions, the signal must also be measured at both detectors, about 10 to 15 milliseconds apart from one another. This is because gravitational waves propagate through space at the speed of light, so they will hit the two detectors at a time predetermined by their distance from one another. If only one detector sees the signal, then it was probably caused by something local, like a small earthquake or someone dropping their hydro flask. Okay, but how can quantum computers help here? Well, it turns out that quantum computers can be useful for match filtering. The quantum algorithm matches classical performance while using a completely different method. This method gets its speed up using quantum state preparation. Before I get into quantum state preparation, I'm going to give a quick speed run of the quantum theory that you'll need to know to understand it. First, a quantum computer is composed of qubits. These are individual quantum systems that we can directly control. They have two states, which correspond to physical quantities, like spin, that we can interact with. Qubits can be put into a superposition. This means that we can set a qubit to have a 50% probability of being in the zero state, and a 50% probability of being in the one state, or anything in between. Furthermore, two or more qubits can be entangled. Think of entanglement as a type of superposition, but specifically where that superposition cannot mathematically be factored into a product of two qubits. Put another way, two qubits, A and B, are entangled when measuring the state of qubit A tells you the state of qubit B. For many qubits, we can write out the superposition states as long sums, where each possible combination of all of the qubits is given some weight or probability. Okay, I know that was a lot, but it's necessary background to understand the rest of the algorithm. Quantum state preparation is a technique where some initial state is encoded on a quantum computer and then measured relatively quickly after. In these types of algorithms, comparatively few logic gates need to be applied, and so we call them shallow circuits. The important thing that this implies is that, since the circuit depths are shallow, we can run these quantum algorithms on real quantum computers right now, and get actual results. Now again, these results are not yet faster than classical computers, but they are scientifically relevant and interesting in their own right. Now let's actually get into the quantum algorithm to see how this works. For both classical and quantum computing, mash filtering starts by writing down a convolution, which turns out to be this sum that we'll call rho. Here, j is the time delay between x and y, x is a digitized template signal, which is our theoretical prediction, and y is the actual data, meaning what we measured with the detector. Changing J lets us slide the template signal back and forth to maximize the signal-to-noise ratio with respect to the data stream. Classically computing this convolution scales like O of N times L, where N is the size of the template signal and L is the stream of data points. This means if we want to analyze a signal, it takes us about N, the size of the template signal, times L, the number of data points, number of operations, in order to actually compute the convolution. However, there's a trick. If we go to the frequency domain with a Fourier transform, we can bring this time complexity down to O of L times log N, which is significantly faster. The computation of this convolution, however, can still be completed quickly in the time domain if instead of using a classical computer, we use a quantum computer. When we do this, we get time complexity scaling of O of L times log N squared. Since both log n and log n squared grow very, very slowly compared to just n itself, the two computational efficiencies are considered to be very similar. Okay, so both the classical and quantum solutions scale logarithmically, but the quantum solution somehow does it while staying in the time domain, whereas the classical solution relies on changing to the frequency domain. But how do we actually compute this sum convolution thing that I told you about? Well, first we'll use quantum amplitude encoding to encode the digital signals for both the template and the real signal from the black holes into our quantum computer's qubits. This involves preparing quantum states where the amplitudes of the states represent the signal values. 
The encoding can be complex and often requires optimization techniques to ensure efficient representation of the signals. Complexity-wise, this encoding phase scales like log L squared. However, after some clever parallelization, this can be reduced to log N squared. Now, here's where the magic happens. Once the quantum states are prepared, we're already almost done. If we measure our system, our measurement itself will generate the products of all the states that we need for our sum. In other words, the encoding and measurement do the calculation for us. The quantum measurement collapses the superposition of states, and the probabilities of the outcomes are related to the values of the convolution sum, where again, x and y are our template and data stream. The signal-to-noise ratio corresponds to the probability of measuring each of the resulted states. Repeated actions of this measurement process reproduce the sum, as weighted by the probabilities set in the encoded phase. Finally, the results of the measurements are aggregated and processed classically to produce a final signal-to-noise ratio. This algorithm was run on actual IBM hardware for this paper, and the classical and quantum versions look very similar. Here are some of the results. If you want to learn how they did this, then check out this video of me coding a real quantum algorithm on an IBM quantum computer. Otherwise, I've been Lucas, this has been Lucas's lab, and thanks for watching.